Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are at the Transformative Technology Conference. We, our mind has been blown over and over and over again. We are now with Dr. Bashar Bajran. Thank you for joining us on Thank the you. show. Really appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you. And Bashar's a neuroscientist at the Medical University of South Carolina. That's correct. And you were t telling me that you were wor working on the vagus nerve, vagus nerve. Um, there's just a lot of stuff that you're doing. I'm, I'm excited to learn more about this. There's yeah. a lot to unpack. Oh, the uh, transcranial direct, direct transcranial direct current direct stimulation current and TMS stimulation. magnetic stimulation. It's all yes. all of the above. Yeah. yeah. So okay, but even before we talk about. <clears throat> exactly what you've been up to most recently. Let's talk about how you even got excited about neuroscience. Like, who are you? How did you yeah, get to Yeah, this so point? I'm a trained uh, neuroscientist from the Medical University of South Carolina. That's where I did my graduate training. I did it under the direction of Mark George, who is known for inventing TMS to treat depression. Whoa. So kind of the pedigree and history of my lab goes back to the 80s. Um, and in the 80s was kind of this evolution of using brain stimulation as a non-pharmacological intervention to treat neuropsychiatric disorders. So really there was two kind of big findings in the 80s. Uh, one was by Tony Barker, who uh, is from the UK, he's an awesome dude. Uh, he invented a machine that can deliver magnetic stimuli um, to the nervous system. And my mentor Mark at the time was training in the UK saw one of these machines and said, hey, we can put this on, on the head and stimulate the brain, neurons in the brain, to treat depression. And that's w when it all started in the late 80s. It went on into the 90s where um, at MUSC, they ran all the early clinical trials and developed TMS as now an FDA-approved treatment for major depressive disorder. Um, and it took about 10 or 15 years of development to get to the point where a company, Neuronetics, ended up taking the technology, running with it, and getting an FDA indication for depression. So that uh, is really a game yeah. changer in psychiatry. It's really one of the only non-pharmacological interventions for yeah. depression. Yeah. Um, there's also one other really cool finding in the 80s was... Wait, can we talk about what part of the... Uh, how, we're, how exactly it's happening? Of course. Happening? Yeah. So TMS. Yeah. It's really essentially a big stack of capacitors. Electricity comes in from the wall, is stored in these capacitors, and then rapidly discharged at a specific frequency uh, through an electromagnetic coil, which is essentially a bunch of copper windings, right? So when electricity goes through these copper windings, it creates an induced magnetic field. Mm. Magnetic field's a few centimeters, and if you put that on the brain, on the skull, essentially, and fire these magnetic pulses at a specific pulse pattern, mm. you induce electrical currents in the brain. Mm -hmm. Those stimulate neurons and cause kind of a long-term plasticity that helps treat mm -hmm. a variety of disorders. For depression, we stimulate the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, EEG position F3, which is like right here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And if you uh, deliver about 10 hertz... That's like executive functioning. Correct. Cognitive functioning, executive control, um, and also mood. And, mood. and so what we do is we deliver TMS to that position five days a week, for four to six weeks, and people that have failed a series of antidepressants, several series of antidepressants, they're really refractory, they come in, uh, they see the doc, they get treated at the clinic, and after four to six weeks, they can go back to their jobs, and, it's, and they're fully better, they remit. So they come in with really high depression rating scores, the Hamilton rating, depression rating score in the 20s, high 20s. Is that still used? The Hamilton? The Hamilton. The depression rating score. Yeah, so it's called the HAMD. MD. Um, and that's used clinically. It's a kind of a clinical questionnaire that's administered. It's not subjective. Um, so oh, I would wow. ask you a series of questions and then the rater would rate your depression symptoms. Interesting. Oh, instead of self-diagnosing. Uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's, uh, we do these weekly and we track the progress. People oh, cool. That's how you know that TMS is working. Cause yep. Oh, because you're at your, you have like a psychiatrist that's asking the Correct. questions. So the psychiatrist is there weekly evaluating. Usually it's on like a Friday to get the lay of the land and we can track. Usually people respond uh, to TMS in two to three weeks and they're all the way better by week six. Uh, now we're making a lot of advancements on kind of shortening the total treatment length by doing multiple sessions in a day. So we can try to shorten that treatment course from four to six weeks to about two weeks. Uh, with these kind of rapid uh, paradigms that we're developing right now. 
And and what are you so now so now tell us kind of like the exact uh, the exact process for somebody um, they they come in their ham D score is would it be high or low if, high if they would be high okay mm-hmm. so ham D score is high and then you say okay we can do TMS right here on the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex correct and then we can do that once a day for four to six weeks. Correct. And then we'll evaluate you midway through and at the end or like We evaluate weekly and it's weekly. really daily, you know? Yeah. The physician's always interacting with the patient and the nursing staff and personnel. Yeah. We're seeing these patients every day. And then and then what is what is what is going on especially in that left DLPFC area of the brain? Like what, where are you, by stimulating that area magnetically and causing that area to fire, what is, why, why is that specifically causing them to be less depressed? Like, is it taking attention away from another depressive area or like, how, yeah, how is It's a good question. You know, there's a lot of different hypotheses on how depression works. It's still kind of unknown, but one of the major ones is there's this uh, under activation in uh, just resting activation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Mm. So a lot of early studies in the 90s were showing that there was decreased metabolism, so less active neurons in the DLPFC, and that really uh, mm-hmm. elicited this kind of target. But there's also this idea that uh, the DLPFC is part of this larger network with substructures that are deep in the brain, like the anterior cingulate, mm-hmm. that are involved in mood and mm-hmm. salience, mm-hmm. right? So uh, it's kind of doing a twofold. Twofold. When we do TMS in the fMRI scanner, so we can actually do TMS in the scanner. Oh, interesting. It's really complicated cool. and awesome. Yeah. We can look at what's happening in the brain in response to a single session of TMS. Yeah. And we're creating inc- increased blood oxygenation level dependent signal, bold signal, uh-huh. which means that part of the brain in response to the magnetic stimulation is becoming more active for that period of time. It slowly goes away. The more you do it, the longer that effect stays, eventually it sticks. Now, does this potentially have something to do with how when I feel like I don't have something to like, that my executive functioning saying, go and build this aspect of whatever may brings meaning to your life. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have that clicking, I kind of tend to go to Netflix or Facebook or whatever it might be. um, And I might not find as much meaning or fulfillment in life by doing that. Perhaps, although maybe you're just procrastinating from a task that you really don't want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So TMS doesn't help with that. Yeah, yeah. But um, people that are depressed really wouldn't even be able to watch Netflix. Some of the patients we see are uh, staying at home. They've generally uh, quit their jobs. Um, they really can't function. Some of them are bedridden and stay in bed. Oh yeah, um, that's right. So that's there's right. this idea or this term there called anhedonia. There was a movie on that. Um, at I believe it was a, I don't think it was a motor, I don't think it was a motor reason, I think it was a depressive reason. Oh, what movie? I I should remember the name, but. um, It's okay. Yeah, okay. So so here's the deal. There are these physiological problems that occur within us that cause people to be bedridden. Yeah, Yeah, so eventually that's called catatonia. Catatonia. And when you have catatonia, you end up actually um, being a little too sick to get TMS. You end up getting something called ECT. Um, oh. One of our friends and mentors, Harold what does that Sackheim, stand for? Uh, electroconvulsive therapy. I think that might have been. So there's it. an old movie that kind of stigmatized ECT called "One F- One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest." Yes, yes, right? yes. And that actually did, I think, a disservice to ECT because it's really one of the most effective treatments for depression that we have. Uh-huh. Um, when people come in with catatonia or they're admitted into the unit, uh, ECT brings them right back to to step one and. You only need about you know ten or twelve treatments. There's about three treatments a week for a couple weeks, and they're way better than they started. So now, Bashar, where are you amongst everything that you've been describing? Are you uh, analyzing things and making sure that everything's going well out of the whole? So that's arc? a great question. Usually, I, I'm the one that develops the new paradigms. So a couple of the kind of new paradigms we thought is rather than just focusing on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Perhaps you can use different cortical uh, targets to stimulate networks, right? So the most recent two developments in TMS that I did in my lab was 
one, targeting the pre-supplementary motor area, which is right here. It's connected to deep uh, motor control networks. And we did that to treat essential tremor. We also used that site to kind of detune the obsessional thoughts in OCD. So we did that in 2013 and 14, and now that's actually gone to FDA approval. Now people can get TMS for OCD based on that early findings. We do TMS paired with an exposure uh, therapy, and it gets people who are refractory uh, in their OCD treatment to pretty much uh, remit. So they get all the way better um, in OCD. It's amazing. So Whoa. that's kind of some of the stuff we do in the lab. We yeah. have an active um, brain stimulation clinic mm -hmm. that treats uh, folks from the community um, that are usually depressed, bipolar, anxious, um, and then we develop the new paradigms. But that's only kind of one third of what we do. Um, we also do something called vagus nerve stimulation, mm -hmm. which was developed in the 80s by Jake Zabara, who's a friend and mentor. Um, in the early 80s, and this they, is a beautiful nerve that goes. The vagus yeah. nerve's awesome. It's yeah. really this large central bundle of nerves. Um, it runs from your brain all the way down and targets every smooth mu muscle organ in your body. Stomach, heart, lungs, spleen, kidneys, intestines, bladder, all of it. Wow. So your eyes allow you to see uh, what's in front of you and what's in this room and I could look out and there's someone swimming in the pool. Mm -hmm. um, but your, your internal organs need to communicate with your brain too. And the vagus nerve is how they communicate with the brain. Kind of like how your eyes communicate with your brain, with the optic nerve. Yeah. That's what the vagus nerve is for. And if you look at it's all of the highway, function. It's a highway of communication. Yeah, it's really a super highway. And it's this yeah. bundle that can target all of these nerves. It's a majority of your daily life functions that you even don't even know that, yeah. are, that, are, that are on. These are the autonomic. It's an autonomic nervous system nerve. Yeah. It's really associated with the parasympathetic nervous system or the slowing yeah, yeah. of bodily functions. So there's really two uh, autonomic control systems. The sympathetic, which is really your fight or flight and gets you up and stressed and ready to evolutionarily escape from a stressor. Mm -hmm. Or the parasympathetic, which allows you to slow, right? Mm -hmm. Go to sleep, relax your heart rate, yeah. digest. digest. And so uh, those are cholinergic. So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter mm -hmm. associated with mm -hmm. this pathway. The vagus nerve dumps acetylcholine onto these organs and it causes a relaxation and slowing. That process That's starts at the brain. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that the Correct. vagus nerve dumps into the system Onto the organs. for the, um, for the uh, parasympathetic nervous system functioning. Correct. But that is initiated in the brain. So before it dumps yeah. any type of neurotransmitter, yeah. there is a complex system that's uh, initiated kind of in these deeper brain structures that then send the signal out to the vagus nerve. So then there's like, there's this, from the brain we go down, there's all the, the cerebral spinal um, neural system, and then mm -hmm. there's also the vag vagus nerve Correct. system. So, so it's kind of, yeah, it's cool. The vagus is in uh, your thorax. So it's in your, in the cavity, in your body's cavity. It doesn't initiate in the yeah, spine, it's yeah. wandering. And so vagus yeah. is, lat is Latin for wandering. For wandering? So it's, <laughs> it used to, uh, it was cool. called the wandering nerve, and I'll show you in my talk later today that, uh, it was, there was this Italian uh, neuroanatomist that dissected the body in the 1500s. It's this beautiful image Whoa. of all of the nerves in the body, spine. And you can see the vagus nerve is literally the, the most complicated part of the entire thing. And so that's where it got its name as the wandering nerve because it just travels throughout your body. Yeah. And what's interesting is there's not only uh, efferent effects or from the brain to the body, but you can actually go from the body to the brain, right? So it's bi-directional communication. And we can take advantage of that by stimulating it to access deep parts of the brain. Okay, now t teach us about how to stimulate the vagus nerve and what it does. What so yeah. in the early, um, well actually it's really late um, 1980s, there was a neurophysiologist, Jake Zabara, who had a epileptic dog model. So a canine dog that had epilepsy he uh, implanted the uh, electrodes onto the nerve directly of the vagus nerve. Mm. And when he turned on electrical stimulation. Ex externally? Still? Internally. Internally, okay, okay. So you do the dissection okay, okay. Um, and you access it uh, really kind of in the um, cervical part of your neck. You can't do external stimulation of vagus nerve. 
you that's can't. what, what oh. you can, and okay, that's what okay. we've been developing. Okay, sorry, I jumped the gun. Keep, keep yeah. going, yeah. But all of the early studies were implantable. In fact, uh, when you turn on electrical stimulation onto the nerve, you stop the epileptic waveform. Whoa. Stops epilepsy. So that's where VNS started. Huh. Um, and from then on, the Jake... Vegas nerve simulation. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So the VNS. Uh -huh. uh, actually, Jake, uh, interesting fact that not a lot of people know is that he called it a neurocybernetic prosthesis. Mm. But the, uh, the medical communi community didn't really understand that, and they changed the name to Vegas nerve stimulation. So initially it was NCP, mm -hmm. um, which then became VNS. <laughs> I like NCP better, but VNS is cool and it's stuck. Yeah. So um, that ended up becoming a company that Jake founded called Cybronics. Um, and over 150,000 people across the world have been implanted with a VNS stimulator to treat their refractory epilepsy. Whoa. 30 to 40% of people implanted have reductions of more than 75% of their daily seizures that didn't respond to meds. It's amazing. So just wow. a little ele electricity here um, actually ends up stopping your, your seizures. Yeah. Wow. And then from then on, there was actually Whoa. a really astute, and this is like a cool history lesson, an astute um, hotel clerk that noticed that these patients that had epilepsy uh, that were coming to stay for follow-up visits, their moods were getting better. And yeah. he reported it to one yeah, of the yeah. docs. That's cool. They, they, they then explored VNS to treat depression, and it treats depression. Whoa. So it became this um, epilepsy treatment, depression treatment. Recently, it's been FDA approved for uh, chronic morbid obesity. So if Whoa. you plant stimulators at the level on the, on the vagus nerve, right above the stomach, yeah. uh, it decreases uh, your appetite, appetite. and uh, reduces obesity symptoms. So Great. people lose body fat. Pr that sounds a lot better than the gastro bypass surgery. Well, in fact, when people get their stomach stapled for those types of procedures, sometimes in rare cases, um, there's a mistake and they actually staple over the vagus nerve. And if you damage the vagus nerve, all of the downstream communication for the vagus uh, becomes interrupted. So it's yeah, actually yeah. pretty risky. So that, I mean, these are all yeah. the developments, but you can't really implant everybody to try out a bunch of stuff. It's expensive. It costs yeah. about $50,000. You have to go into the OR and do it. Any surgeon yeah, trained yeah, in yeah. head and neck dissection can do it. But it's not really common for individuals that are exploring it for other things. Mm -hmm. So what uh, my group's been doing, I've been doing a lot of research on this in the last five years, is developing non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. So rather than implanting electrodes, you can stimulate a branch of the vagus nerve that innervates your ear. Mm. That's called the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. Mm. And you can use electricity to stimulate that nerve and mimic the effects of implantable, which now has opened up this entire field of VNS to everybody. It reduces heart rate, it increases heart rate variability, it treats depression. Mm. It doesn't work super well on epilepsy, but that's because it's still early and the dose isn't optimized. But where, uh, where does the ex electrode go externally? So the electrode goes uh, in your ear. So you can stimulate the auricular branch of the vagus nerve either in the left or right ear. Um, and this small little off branch of the main bundle yeah. uh, can be targeted in your ear, right in, there's a couple different targets. One is the anterior wall of the external ear canal. So like your tragus, but on the back side of your little uh -huh, tragus. Uh -huh. Or you can target the simbaconcha, which is this kind of top part on the inside uh, circle of your ear. Uh -huh. Or you can target it on the mastoid. Whoa! And so. you can just you can is that a is that a electrical stimulation? Then? Electrical stimulation. So we um, a long time ago they tried to do magnetic stimulation there, but it's uncomfortable to deliver magnetic pulses there because there's a lot of muscles. So uh, what we thought was perhaps we can do electricity to mimic it. We started these studies in 2013, mm -hmm. um, and we explored the entire parameter space. So low frequency, high frequency, big pulse width, long, or short pulse width, long stimulation, short stimulation, different electrodes, different, different targets. And over the years, we've optimized this technology, and now it's rolling out into several clinical trials across the United States. So this is all at MUSC. At MUSC. Okay. And how long has it been that you've been doing that there? Six years. Six years there. Yeah. And then you have a lab there. Correct. And what's the lab called? So it's the Brain Stimulation Lab. Brain Stimulation Lab. Correct. And then uh, how many people are in the lab right now? 
The lab is pretty big. So we have around 20 staff. 20 staff. Um, nice. We have the division director, Mark George, who's still nice. around. We have uh, three other faculty there uh, who do a variety of things from a neurostimulation to treat addictions, yeah. uh, PTSD, working with vet uh, veterans. Um, there's a really interesting individual, Dr. Xing Bao Li, who does TMS for smoking cessation. Nice. It works really well to help yeah. people quit smoking, Whoa. which is a really big problem in the United States. Oh, this list is crazy. Okay, so helping with smoking, helping with addiction, helping with uh, PTSD, helping um, with, uh, with potential stump, st uh, gas, uh, hunger, uh, depressing... So the, hunger. I, but I think what the most cool part of the entire yeah. thing is, besides all of these, by the way, we're doing Parkinson's uh, with vagus nerve stimulation, uh, but the most interesting th project is that I'm doing with uh, Dr. Do Jenkins, who, who's a pediatric neonatologist. He's using uh, non-invasive VNS paired with uh, bottle suck training Whoa. Um, okay. in preterm neonates to okay. accelerate the learning of how to feed um, and put down a formula um, to be discharged from a hospital faster when they're born with a hypoxic ischemic event. And what's the hypoxic ischemic event that so, prevents them from being discharged? So before the, when the babies are born, either preterm or at term, but with um, essentially a brain injury where they lose ox oxygen to the brain, oh. they don't have the ability to feed on a bottle. So what they do oh. is they stay in the nursery with their family for up to six weeks and they're trained how to use uh, a bottle, suck on a nipple and put down food. If yeah. they don't put down food, they get discharged with a gastric gastric tube, a GI tube, Wow. where the mom then has to feed the baby uh, through a port in the Oy. stomach. So what we thought was we can take advantage of this vagus nerve, which also enhances um, kind of a global metaplasticity. We pair vagus nerve stimulation with training and rehabilitation on how to feed with occupational therapists. And the babies, rather than waiting six weeks and then getting a GI tube, over half of them are discharged without a G tube and they could discharge way faster. So between yeah. 10 and 20 days rather than six weeks. Yeah, yeah. So that's really the most that's promising cool work stuff. at MUSC. Yeah. yeah, and so that just got published recently as a brief report. Now we're doing the larger clinical trial. Yeah, and how many children are born with that inability to, to suck on the nipple? You know, I'm not too familiar with the percentages. Okay. Um, but it's pretty common. And okay. these, a lot of the babies that are born preterm uh, don't have this ability. So even if you don't have the hypoxic ischemic event, a lot of babies are candidates for G-tubes because they just can't learn how to feed. Now, you, you don't hear about a lot of these cases. You really hear about the healthy ones. Oh, I had a healthy baby, uh, and it's doing great. But there's a lot of babies I in, the, in the unit that have this difficulty feeding and get sent home with a surgery and a G-tube. Wow. Um, holy cow, Bashar. Um, I am so impressed there's so much so much different stimulation that can occur electrically and magnetically to solve so many different uh it, problems that exist in, in in humans that that i think can um, help create a healthier happier civilization it's, oh yeah and you're you're investigating into all of these right now we test all of them and what's really fascinating is that these technologies end up trickling down to people like me and you so we take these treatments that help people and treat disorders, mm -hmm. and then we investigate how they can help us in our day-to-day -day life. One of the prime examples is what I was telling you earlier is using TDCS, this low electrical current stimulation, about two milliamps, it runs off a small nine volt battery, mm. it's pretty cheap and mm. inexpensive. We use that to help people feel calm and relaxed and accelerate their meditative practice. So that was something that we used to research for pain and cognitive enhancement has now trickled down into a paradigm called e-meditation that came out of MUSC as well. And we use that, we were actually demoing it here at the conference. There's 40 people in Vermont that are doing the first ever brain stimulation retreat where they meditate um, at a monastic center for five days using brain stimulation to augment their meditation practice. Oof, yeah. It's really cool stuff. Uh, so that method's called e-meditation. Um, I've been thinking about that for a while because Whenever I go to the 10 day meditation retreats, they just came back from one. Uh -huh. I, I always love the idea of thinking how to augment it. Because 2,500 years ago, when this is you know, conceived, this isn't really, you, we didn't have the uh, like TD, TDCS, CS and we didn't have 
um, access to so many like other psychedelics that we could, you know. So there's so many different ways to kind of add variables to the meditation mixture to just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So what you know, we what we know is safe, and what we know actually works in the sick brain is now coming to individuals in the healthy brain to optimize human performance and help help us connect and interact with each other and hopefully make a better world one day. Um, if I we can it. all uh, connect with each other and, and be kind to one another through these really transformative technologies like e-meditation, uh, we can really change the world. And that's what we've been developing uh, at MUSC. Um, it's really exciting. So that's the stuff that gets me out of bed every day yeah. is, uh, is doing the whole gamut of brain stimulation and Hopefully, uh, one of these things will be able to be used in the general public um, to improve day-to-day -day life. I love it. You are amazing. You're amazing. Thank you. It's so, it's so, I'm so grateful to have been able to interview you. I think there's a lot of cool collaboration explorations we can do with um, an organization called BrainMind. Um, we'd like to potentially loop you into that, as well as um, you know, Neuroscape over here at uh, Adam Gazzelli's uh, lab over here. Great. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff to explore. So I'm, again, super grateful for you. Thank you of so course. much. Hey, no problem. Teaching us about everything you're up to. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's yeah. really cool. Your story's incredible, and what you're working on is amazing. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Also, go and build the future. Go manifest your dreams into the world, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Much love. That was That's so great. fun, man. You are, you are, you are a rock star.